Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Peter Terry. I'm uh, introducing Violetta today. Violetta Zane is our presenter. I think uh, all of you were here in previous sessions, so uh, you know who she is and you know what she's talking about. But this is going to be uh, uh, a, a biography of um, Abdul Bahan. It's going to be in nine sections, and she's in section number two, part number two. And we're on our fourth session today. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to see all of you again and hope you'll keep coming back. And uh, so without further ado, I'm introducing Violetta to take it from here. Hello, everyone. Um, just as a reminder, yesterday we finished day three on the story of the wedding of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha and Muni Rehanum. This is Muni Rehanum here, and this is uh, Muni Rehanum and Bahi Hanum, the greatest holy leaf, and the and the they're the four daughters of, of Abdul Baha. And today we're going to be finishing up part two and hopefully getting started on part three. And we're going to begin with late 1873 to 1877 last years in Akka for Baha'u'llah and the house of Abu. Now, in our little ongoing map of the houses of Baha'u'llah in Akka, you see the first four houses in black here, the houses of Malik and Chavam, the house of Rabie, the house of Udi Hamar, and right next to it, the house of Abu. They were originally one house and they're going to become one house again. The Holy Family has now made a home inside Akka in a Christian quarter for the last several years. Living among the inhabitants of the penal colony, the inevitable happens, of course. Abdul Baha's saintly character and constant devotion to the poor and the needy touch the hearts of most who meet him. Abdul Baha is more than ever the shield of Baha'u'llah. He meets with public officials, manages the day-to-day -day affairs of the family, and works assiduously to make the lives of Baha'is and Akka as comfortable as possible. In this climate of improving relations, Ilyas Aboud, the owner of the house of Aboud and their neighbor when they lived in the house of Udi Kamar, he becomes ill and wishing to leave Akka, he rents this house, which has a seafront, the house of Abud, to Baha'u'llah. For the first time in many, many years, the Holy Family has now ample room and a befitting house. The partition between the two houses is torn down, and there are many windows and two upper courts. Baha'u'llah's room, which you see here, is light and airy and has a covered balcony with a view of the sea. And this is where Baha'u'llah will continue to reveal the Kitabi Akdas, which he began revealing in the house of Udi Hamar. Since 1868, however, Baha'u'llah has not set foot beyond the Akka city walls. And his sole exercise has been to endlessly pace the room, the floor of his room. Abdul Baha continuously concerned with how to make Baha'u'llah's life more pleasant, borrows some money and repairs the bath in the house of Abud. Water can now be warmed up in just half an hour and this convenience brings great joy to Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha repays the borrowed money within four months. 1873-1875, a beautiful friendship, the governor of Akka, Ahmad bin Tawfiq, and Abdul Baha. This is the aqueduct of Akka, which is used to carry water into the city. It was built in about 1815 to replace an earlier aqueduct destroyed by Napoleon. By the time of Baha'u'llah's arrival, it has fallen into serious disrepair. 
Abdul Baha had arrived in Akka three years prior as an exile and a prisoner, forbidden to interact with the local population. But three years is a long time, and the extraordinary nature of Abdul Baha has acted like a veritable dew and deeply penetrated the soil of the hearts of the Akka and its people. Abdul Baha is now 28 years old and described at this moment in his life by Shori Effendi as being in the full flower of his manhood. Abdul Baha has maintained constant contact with the rank and file of the population. When Ahmad Beek Taufik replaces Sali Pasha, the previous governor who had been ill disposed toward Baha'u'llah. Ahmad Beek Taufik and Abdul Baha meet for the first time on the beach. Abdul Baha, as was his habit, had come for a swim and the governor had come to seek him out, knowing of the master's swimming habit. Ahmad Bik Tofik has been handed Baha'i writings by the covenant breakers to poison him against Baha'u'llah, but the ruse had backfired. The governor is impressed and bewildered and wants to know more, which is how he now finds himself on the beach in Akka, listening to Abdul Baha. The story of Ahmad Big Tawfiq is one of a pure heart being enkindled. The more he learns, the more he wants to know. He requests that all the tablets and writings of Baha'u'llah he owns be recopied in the best calligraphy possible. Ahmad Big Tawfiq's devotion is gradually kindled, both through his association with Abdul Baha and by studying the holy writings of the Baha'i faith. He becomes so overwhelmed and captivated by Abdul Baha's majesty of bearing, his charm of manners, the dignity of his behavior, his ocean-like depth of knowledge, that Ahmad Bik Tawfiq removes his shoes each time he enters Abdul Baha's presence in a show of deep reverence. The people of Akka begin speaking behind the governor's back whispering that his favorite counselors are the Baha'i exiles. In fact, Ahmad Bik Tawfiq sends his own son to Abdul Baha for instruction and enlightenment. During one of Ahmad Bik Tawfiq's long awaited audiences with Baha'u'llah, he requests permission to render Baha'u'llah a service. Baha'u'llah suggests that the aqueduct of Akka, which had fallen into ruin over the previous 30 years, be repaired. Ahmad Bik Tawfiq immediately begins work on the aqueduct, which will be completed by a subsequent governor. Eventually, after having been deprived of potable water for decades, the residents of Akka will have access, easy and ready access to fresh water, thanks to the generosity of Baha'u'llah. Towards the end of his governorship at the request of Baha'u'llah in a private audience, Ahmad Bik Tawfiq agrees to review all the cases of those Baha'is who were detained during the murders of the covenant breakers. While he was holding office, neither Baha'u'llah nor Abdul Baha showed Ahmad Bik Tawfiq any special favor. However, when it becomes official that he is leaving for another post, Abdul Baha showers him with such hospitality that the population of Akka is astonished. Speechless, Abdul Baha sets up a tent for Ahmad Bik Tawfiq by the sea, where he can receive all his friends and all the guests that are wishing him farewell. The Holy Family provides lunch and dinner for all those who come to visit Ahmad Bik Tawfiq for the few days he remains beneath the tent by the Mediterranean Sea as he is preparing to leave. Ahmad Bik Tawfiq asks for a copy of the greatest name and Mirza Muhammad Ali, the son of Baha'u'llah and half brother of Abdul Baha, who is a master calligrapher, obliges. Until the day of his departure from Akka, Ahmad Bik Tawfiq constantly expresses his sorrow at the impending separation 
from Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. 1875, The Secret of Divine Civilization. Abdu'l-Baha anonymously publishes a treatise on societal reform entitled The Secret of Divine Civilization. The original Persian translates literally as the mysterious forces of civilization. And Shoghi Effendi refers to Abdu'l-Baha's anonymous work as Abdu'l-Baha's outstanding contribution to the future reorganization of the world. True, this is a quote from uh, The Secret of Divine Civilization. True civilization will unfurl its banner in the midmost heart of the world whenever a certain number of its distinguished and high-minded sovereigns, the shining exemplars of devotion and determination, shall for the good and happiness of mankind arise with firm resolve and clear vision to establish the cause of universal peace. They must make the cause of peace the object of general consultation and seek by every means in their power to establish a union of the nations of the world they must conclude a binding treaty and establish a covenant, the provisions of which shall be sound, inviolable, and definite. They must proclaim to all the world and obtain for it the sanction of all the human race. This supreme and noble undertaking, the real source of the peace and well-being of all the world, should be regarded as sacred by all that dwell on earth. All the forces of humanity must be mobilized to ensure the stability and permanence of this most great covenant. And if you would like to listen to an excerpt of The Secret of Divine Civilization in the original Persian, subtitled in English, so you can hear the sweetness of the original, you can go to the chronology and click on this graphic and you'll hear an excerpt we've called The Honor and Distinction of the Individual. The same year that The Secret of this Divine Civilization is published, 1875, Abdul Baha rents the Rizvan Gardens for Baha'u'llah. This is an aerial view of the Rizvan Gardens taken in May 18, 1967. You can clearly see Akka, that very particular shape of the peninsula right there, right here. That is Akka where Baha'u'llah has spent nine years without seeing any greenery. Abdu'l-Baha meticulously prepares for two years in order to offer Baha'u'llah the most verdant, beautiful, pleasant surroundings possible. For nearly a decade, Baha'u'llah has not set foot outside the walls of this desolate stone city. The only walking Baha'u'llah has done these many years is to pace within the walls of his bedchamber. In 1875, his devoted son Abdul Baha makes the major first step towards Baha'u'llah's later years of rest in places of beauty. Abdul Baha rents a garden. One kilometer outside the southeastern corner of the walls of Akka runs a little stream named Namain. The name Namain means two yeses after the Islamic tradition that states that yes will be called twice on the last day when God calls out, am I not your Lord? Yes. Yes, and the name of the stream that surrounds the garden is two yeses, Namai. This little river empties into a main channel close to the Mediterranean, but in the last meanders of its journey, the Namai River surrounds a green knoll. This verdant isle is that garden that Abdul Baha rents for Baha'u'llah. He will rename it Rezvan, meaning 
paradise. In 1875, it has none of what we are familiar with, such as the blue and white benches. There is only one structure on the property, a very simple house for the gardener or the caretaker. Baha'u'llah will later use this room in the, the one room building to rest while he visits the garden of Rizban and he will also reveal tablets there. Spring 1877 to June 1877, Abdu'l-Baha prepares Mazra'i for, Baha for Baha'u'llah. This is the mansion of Mazra'i, very different than what we now know, taken in the 1930s, the first decade of Shoghi Effendi's guardianship. Baha'u'llah has had a deep love for nature since childhood. Born in Tehran, but ancestrally originally from Mazandaran, a province of rolling verdant hills in which he spent quite a bit of his childhood and youth. One day, Baha'u'llah makes a passing remark. I have not gazed on verdure for nine years. The country is the world of the soul. The city is the world of the bodies. Abdul Baha hears this remark secondhand and determines to do whatever is in his power to bring greenery back into Baha'u'llah's life. About four kilometers north of Akka is a mansion which has been left empty. It is called Mazra'e and is a lovely place with a stream surrounded by gardens. Abdul Baha pays a visit to the owner of Mazra'e, a man named Mohammed Pasha Safwat, very much opposed to the Baha'is, and asks the owner why this mansion is uninhabited. The man responds he is an invalid and cannot leave the walls of Akka and gets lonely in Mazra'i, far away from his friends. Abdul Baha offers to rent the place from him and the man agrees. Abdul Baha gets a very good price and rents Mazra'i for five pounds a year. He has a contract drawn up and pays Mohammed Pasha Safwat for five years in advance. Then Abdul Baha sets everything in motion, never leaving Akka to fulfill his silent promise to Baha'u'llah. He hires laborers to repair Mazra'i, has a bath built, arranges for the garden to be tended to, and prepares a carriage for Baha'u'llah. Spring 1877, the banquet under the pines. These are the famous pines of Bahji on the land of the Jamal brothers. This is the site for the vignette below. At last, Abdul Baha decides to visit Mazra'i himself by attempting to walk through the city gate of Akka. Soldiers on duty do not protest. So Abdul Baha returns the next day, this time with friends and some officials. On yet another spring day of 1877, Abdul Baha organizes a banquet at Bahji. He spreads a table under the pine trees and invites notables and officials of Akka. After the banquet in the evening, they all return to Akka together. After these various tests, culminating in the formal banquet invitation, it becomes very clear to Abdul Baha that the Sultan's edict from 1868, nine years ago, is simply a dead letter. And they are no longer really and truly confined to the city walls in the sense that no one will prevent them from walking out, something they would have done in 1868. Between June 3rd and June 10th, 1877, Baha'u'llah consents to leave Akka. This is a modern view of Mazra'i all the way on the edge. And the rest of that stone is stone inside of Akka. And this is a montage made to represent Baha'u'llah's successive no, no, 
no, no, no, yes. Abdu'l-Baha offers Baha'u'llah the carriage to bring him to Mazray, but Baha'u'llah refuses and responds, no. I am a prisoner. Abdu'l-Baha asks a second time and is met with a second refusal. He boldly asks Baha'u'llah, boldly for a third time asks the same question to a manifestation of God and receives the same response. I am a prisoner. Finally, Abdu'l-Baha approaches a benevolent mufti of Akka, his good friend, Sheikh Ali Miri, whom we have previously read about in parts one and two, a man who not only loves Baha'u'llah, but whom Baha'u'llah himself favors. Abdu'l-Baha poses the problem to Sheikh Ali Imiri and plainly asks him to throw himself at Baha'u'llah's feet and beg him to leave the walls of Akka and go to Mazray. These are the desperate words of Abdu'l-Baha to his friend. You are daring. Go tonight to his holy presence. Fall on your knees before him. Take hold of his hand and do not let go until he promises to leave the city. Abdu'l-Baha himself tells the rest of this delightful story. He, Sheikh Ali Imiri, went directly to Baha'u'llah and sat close to his knees. He took hold of the hands of the Blessed Beauty and kissed them and asked, why do you not leave the city? He said, I am a prisoner. The Sheikh replied, God forbid, who has the power to make you a prisoner? You have kept yourself in prison. It was your own will to be imprisoned. And now I beg you to come out and go to the palace. It is beautiful and verdant. The trees are lovely and the oranges like balls of fire. As often as the be blessed beauty said, I am a prisoner, it cannot be. The sheikh took his hands and kissed them. For a whole hour, he kept on pleading. At last, Baha'u'llah said, In Persian, this means very good. And the sheikh's patience and persistence were rewarded. He came to me with a great joy to give the glad news of his holiness's consent. In spite of the strict farman of Abdul Aziz, which prohibited my meeting or having any intercourse with the blessed perfection, I took the carriage next day and drove him to the palace. No one made any objection. This carriage rental in Akka, in 1877, this was a very, very rare luxury. It was very meaningful that Abdul Baha rented a carriage. Between June 3rd and June 10th, 1877, Abdul Baha takes Baha'u'llah to Mazray. Baha'u'llah exited from this door, the city gate, the land gate after he had entered in 1868, nine years before, through the sea gate. The next day and nine years after Baha'u'llah had entered Akka through the sea gate as a prisoner, Abdu'l-Baha drives Baha'u'llah through the land gate to Mazray in the carriage he rented and brings his beloved father beyond the walls of the prison city of Akka for the first time in a decade and to a lush garden surrounded by nature. A new chapter opens. The Extraordinary Life of Abdu'l-Bahá, Part 3, The Master of Akka, 1877-1892, this part covers the life of Abdu'l-Bahá from the age of 33 in 1877 to the age of 48 in 1892. 
This part also covers the life of Baha'u'llah in the mansions of Mazray and Bahji, and the months prior to his ascension in, at the end of May, 1892. So now I'm going to just extend this just a little bit to show you the whole map. This is a little map of the places that we're gonna be talking about in this chronology. You have Akka in brown here. And then here is the Garden of Rizvan. See, it's like one kilometer to the south. Then north of Rizvan is the mansion of Bahji. And north of Bahji is the mansion of Mazre. And to the west, a little bit, is the Garden at Junaini. So these are the main places we'll be talking about. Part one. Akka, 1877 to 1892. I just have to explain a little bit about this section. Abdul Baha lives in Akka permanently from 1868 to 1910. So beyond this part, this part and the whole next part, Abdul Baha lives in Akka. He does not live ever in Mazray and Bahchi. Um, in 1910, he will move permanently to Haifa. So during this period, Abdul Baha maintains a permanent residence in Akka in the house of Abud, but he also travels to Beirut in Lebanon, to Haifa, and to uh, Druze villages um, in the Akka area. So the first part is Mazray between 1877 and 1899, which is when Baha'u'llah lived there. June 1877, Baha'u'llah moves to Mazray. In June 1877, Abdul Baha drives Baha'u'llah and his carriage out of Akka through the land gate and to Mazray. Abdul Baha has been preparing for this move ever since the day he heard Baha'u'llah say he had not gazed on verdure for nine years. Abdul Baha's sole focus from the moment he heard that was to take his beloved father out of the wretched city of Akka and into beautiful surroundings. And this is an aerial view of the mansion of Mazray. You can see it is completely surrounded by nature. This, uh, from lower down, this would have been the view that Baha'u'llah had from the second floor of Mazray, or the, yeah, the second floor. But like from a little bit, a lower elevation, of course, because we're high up in the air for this picture. Mazray could not be more perfect. Built by Abdullah Pasha as a summer residence, it is a very pleasant place, more than, sorry, more than seven kilometers due north of the messy turmoil of Akka. The mansion is nested in a charm charming, quiet countryside with views of the Mediterranean Sea to the west and the valley leading up to the Galilee Hills to the east. The building at Mazre is surrounded by a garden on a vast plain. Baha'u'llah uses the ground floor room as a reception room and meets many believers and pilgrims here. Baha'u'llah's bedroom is on the upper floor of the mansion and boasts a balcony overlooking the beautiful countryside. Once Baha'u'llah is settled in Mazre, free from the oppressive atmosphere he has been subjected to every day since the last nine years in Akka, Abdul Baha returns to the prison city. 1877 to 1879 is a new phase in Baha'u'llah's ministry. This is another view from March 1973 of Mazray. A new phase opens in Baha'u'llah's ministry starting in 1877. These two years, he resides in Mazray before Bahji and his time in Bahji, he is now again, as he had been in childhood, surrounded by nature. The change of scenery and the relative freedom of Baha'u'llah are only one part of this new chapter in his ministry. The most significant factor at play when Baha'u'llah leaves the walls of Akka is the unveiling of his greatness and his majesty and his power. 
first made clear to all when Sheikh Ali Imiri, the highest religious authority in the region of Aga, begged Baha'u'llah to leave the city, begged insistently, throwing himself at his feet, kissing his hands repeatedly. That re will be reinforced over the next 15 years by eminent visitors seeking audiences with Baha'u'llah. Aka, 1877 to 1879, the Holy Family stays behind. This is a view of the House of Abud in 1905. The imprisonment in the barracks have greatly affected Asi Yehanun, also known as Nawab, the wife of Baha'u'llah. Her health has deteriorated and she has become frail. In addition, the very primitive means of travel in the Aka area make travel by the women of the Holy Family very, very difficult. For these reasons, the saintly Nawab and Baha'u'llah's cherished and devoted daughter, Bahi Yehanum, the greatest holy leaf, stay behind in Akka with Abdul Baha when Baha'u'llah moves to Mazray. But Baha'u'llah visits Akka frequently. This is a close up view of Baha'u'llah's beautiful. Mediterranean Sea overlooking wraparound covered balcony in the house of Abud. Because his beloved wife and his beloved daughter and his beloved son and their grandchildren are in Akka, Baha'u'llah often visits Akka and returns to spend most winters in Akka with his wife Nawab and his family in the house of Abud, the whole 15 years that he lives in Mazre and Bachi. Baha'u'llah's room in the house of Abud, where the Kitabi Agdas was re finished revealing, is kept intact and becomes a place of visitation for the Baha'i pilgrims in Akka. Now we are going to come to several long sections about Abdul Baha's responsibilities in Akka. This picture is a picture of spice merchants from Baghdad in Akka around 1901, taken about 20 years after this period. But the merchant tents and the people milling in the background give an idea of the people who were alive there and living, moving, and breathing in Akka and Haifa and the surroundings at the time that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha were by 20 years, which is not much. These are the types of people that in the late, in the early 1900s, Abdul Baha would have interacted to pe with people like this. He would, have, he would have spoken with these people. These are actual people in Akka at the time that Abdul Baha was there. Uh, the main reason that Abdul Baha does not leave Akka for Mazrai or Bachi with Baha'u'llah is that he chooses to continue shouldering a staggering burden of cares and responsibilities in order to relieve Baha'u'llah and leave Baha'u'llah free from, the, from daily uh, chores and responsibilities and free for revelation, which is the most important thing. It is important to keep in mind when reading this account that the people, religious leaders, and government officials Abdul Baha ministers to, counsels, assists, consults with, and helps are not confined to Akka, but also including neighboring towns and sometimes neighboring regions. One last thing to keep in mind is that Abdul Baha had the saintly capacity to devote as much care attention and time to all these facets of his service simultaneously, whether helping a government official avert a crisis or attending to the needs of an orphan. One of the responsibilities of Abdul Baha are the Baha'i pilgrims. These are some eminent Baha'is at the time of Baha'u'llah. Uh, we have standing from left to right, Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, Jamal Effendi, Mirza Abul Kazim Esfahani, 
Mishkin Kalam, Muhammad Rizai Shirazi Kanad, Mirza Jafar, and seated from left to right, we have Mirza Mahmoud Kashani, Mirza Abu Rauf, Mirza Mushin Afnan, Mirza Hadi Afnan, the father of Shoghi Effendi here, and Zainul Mogharabin. You will be most familiar with Zainul Mogharabin, Mishkin Kalam, and Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, the angel of Carmel, who was imprisoned for nine years in the Sudan. Abdul Baha during this time has several main responsibilities. He leads and guides the growing Baha'i community of Accra. He counsels individual Baha'is in their personal and community affairs. Abdul Baha is also greatly involved with the growing influx of pilgrims, whom he prepares physically and spiritually to meet Baha'u'llah, because at that time, Baha'i pilgrimage is not a pilgrimage to shrines where the where the central figures are buried. It is a living pilgrimage. They come to, on pilgrimage to the feet of the living Baha'u'llah. They come to attain his presence. And this has very touching implications. Baha'u'llah is a constant guide to the pilgrim's journey to attain the highest honor of their life. The master ensures each pilgrim feels comfortable in the pilgrim house, the Khan i Avamid, the Inn of the Pillars, the old caravanserai, or elsewhere they are staying. He continually surrounds them with his all-encompassing love and counsels them in the various affairs. The master accompanies them in their spiritual preparation for the moment when they are at last ushered into the presence of Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha is so meticulous that at times he inspects their clothes. When they are unsuitable or worn out, Abdul Baha arranges for new outfits suitable for entering the presence of Baha'u'llah. Ottoman officials. This is a photograph of the Mufti, governor, and other high Ottoman officials of Jerusalem, Palestine in 1900, very closely resembling most probably the types of Ottoman officials and religious leaders whom Abdul Baha met with and talked with and consulted with every day. Abdul Baha also meets officials, notables, and townsmen in his effort to protect the interests of the Baha'i community. Governors and officials of Akka increasingly seek Abdul Baha's profoundly wise counsel on important work related matter. And Abdul Baha often meets with government officials, religious dignitaries, merchant, and learned men. The muftis of Akka, learned scholars, and religious leaders frequently meet with Abdul Baha sometimes sitting at his feet and seeking his knowledge and wisdom. All the people of Akka. This is a Palestinian family around 1900, 1910, and it is a snapshot of what people to whom Abdul Baha would have spoken with every single day would have looked like. Abdul Baha's all encompassing love and care are not limited to the notables of Akka or the Baha'i pilgrims. Each day, Abdul Baha spends many hours visiting the poor and sick in Akka, providing them with attention, love, support, medical treatment, food, and clothing. He is entirely through and through the master of Akka and belongs to everyone. He gives his love as liberally as the sun shines, as freely as the rain falls, and the poor and the needy, the sick and the old, the dying, the widows, the orphans, each and every one of them has a loving father and caretaker in Abdul Baha, who is, I remind you, in his 30s and 40s here. He is not the Abdul Baha with the white beard and the white hair that we know. He is still young here, perhaps graying, but still very young. He's in his 30s when he's doing this, something he will keep doing for the rest of his life. I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into Abdul Baha's grueling schedule. This is the Khan Avamid, the caravanserai in Akka, also known as the Khan of the Pillars, 
or the Khan al-Umdan, taken in the 20s or 30s. This is the first Baha'i pilgrim house, where it's located. And most Baha'is are housed here when the barracks were requisitioned in 1870. To Bahanum, Abdul Baha's second oldest daughter remembers her father's grueling schedule. Abdul Baha rises very, very early, drinks tea, then goes into Akka until very late at night without having eaten or rested. He first goes to the Biruni, a large reception room he has rented across from Genoa Square from the house of Udi Hamar, the old house they first lived in, across that square. People crowd here and ask for his help. Sometimes they want to open a shop and need advice, or they need a letter of introduction. Maybe they need a letter of recommendation for a government post. A woman whose husband has been conscripted as a soldier, leaving her and her children to starve, or a poor woman whose husband is falsely accused, people come to tell Abdul Baha that children are being mistreated, women are being beaten by their husbands or brothers. Abdul Baha sends a competent person to investigate these claims in order to present the case to a judge and obtain justice for the aggrieved party. The mufti, governor, sheikhs, and court officials come to the Biruni alone or in groups to meet Abdul Baha and sip on a particularly delicious type of homemade coffee called Javier Khanigi, where they discuss the news and ask Abdul Baha for explanation, advice, or comment. In the eyes of the officials and people of Akka, Abdul Baha is highly wise, deeply compassionate a learned man who offers practical help and advice liberally to all. When the court of Akka adjourns, the judges invariably come to Abdul Baha's Biruni to discuss complex cases with him. And Abdul Baha, no matter how difficult the problem is, always resolves it. On the busiest days, Abdul Baha hardly sees his family. The people of Akka, Baha'is, Muslims, Christians are under his constant care. He goes to them whenever they need to see him and his responsibilities come first. The only thing Abdul Baha neglects is to rest and to eat. The poor are always his first priority. Abdul Baha makes his friends happy with small gestures. He brings to the Biruni any sweet fruit or cake sent to him. There is no hospital in Akka, but there is Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha hires a doctor named Nikolai Bey to look after the very poor. He's supposed to visit them in their homes with his doctor's um, briefcase and under very strict instructions not to disclose his employer. Unpleasantly, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha indirectly protects Baha'u'llah by staying in Akka. Now, there is in fact one reason alone for Abdul Baha to stay in Akka, and that is to shield Baha'u'llah, to shoulder all the responsibilities and allow Baha'u'llah to be free from daily concerns and remain solely occupied with revelation. But in addition to the list and responsibilities we've just looked at, Abdul Baha indirectly, indirectly protects Baha'u'llah by staying in Naka away from his beloved father, in whose presence he probably wants to be in. Because Baha'u'llah's love for Abdul Baha is so immense, and his praises of Abdul Baha's station are so lofty, that Abdul Baha's half-brother Mirza Muhammad Ali and his mother grow deeply jealous. In the next part, we're going to see how Mirza Muhammad Ali becomes the arch breaker of the covenant of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha's lifelong and inveterate enemy. By staying away from Baha'u'llah who loves him and praises him so, Abdul Baha is able to somewhat dampen that burning fire of jealousy in Mirza Muhammad Ali's heart. In parallel, Baha'u'llah will surround himself with believers who will soon, when he passes away, become covenant breakers. He keeps those people 
most likely to cause trouble close to him as possible in order to keep them in check and mitigate their mischief. What Baha'u'llah does when given a measured amount of freedom is to surround himself with his enemies. Both Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah practice empathy at a very high personal cost. He is the father of Abbas Effendi. Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, pictured here, recounts a delightful moment between 1877 and 1879 when Baha'u'llah, passing in the street, is referred to as the father of Abdul Baha, <laughs> the manifestation of God for today. He is the father of Abbas Effendi. Three months passed, and these are the words of Haji Mirza Haidar Ali. Three months passed, and I was still a pilgrim. During this time, Abdul Baha arranged to rent the mansion of Mazrae, where Baha'u'llah lived for two years. I remember that once the Rizwan feast was celebrated in the house of Jinabi Kalim, uh, the brother of Baha'u'llah, Mirza Musa. His uh, birth name was Kalim, where I was living. A new Pasha had arrived in Akka as the head of the customs house. On that day, he was sitting in a coffee house with many of his officers and other dignitaries of the town. Baha'u'llah was on his way to his brother's house. As he passed the coffee house, the Pasha and his retinue stood up and bowed before him. As he passed by, he bestowed his loving benediction upon them. Then the Pasha, bewildered, approached his friends and asked, is this the Holy Spirit or the King of Kings? Who is he? They replied, he is the father of Abbas Effendi, unanimously. And now Bahji, 1879 to 1889. September, 1879, the mansion of Bahji. I've chosen this picture because this is a story about two believers standing outside of Bahji at a distance, sort of how these people are standing. Baha'u'llah's two years at Mazray are pleasant and productive, but the mansion is far too small to accommodate Baha'u'llah's needs, the needs of the Holy Family and those of a growing community of exiles and expatriate settlers in Akka. While Baha'u'llah is imprisoned in in the barracks between 1868 and 1870, Udi Hamar is busy building his palace, which he calls Bahji, delight. In 1879, an epidemic breaks out in the countryside and people flee. Udi Hamar dies that same year and is buried within the, mall, the walls of his mansion. Abdul Baha first rents, then purchases the mansion of Bahji and Baha'u'llah moves into his final residence in September, 1879. Shoghi Effendi tells us that Baha'u'llah will call Bahji the lofty mansion and the spot which hath God hath ordained as the most sublime vision for mankind. From the window of his room in Bahji, Baha'u'llah can see blue waters of the Mediterranean, the minarets of Akka, and the slope of Mount Carmel in Haifa, where he will soon pitched his tent. Okay. The story I wanted to tell you actually is in the chronology of Baha'u'llah, so. September, 1879, Udi Hamar's prophetic inscription. Now you see here, this inscription, in Arabic, in gorgeous Arabic on stone. It's very small, actually. It's above the, the, the door here. Above the door and above the, 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 the wrought iron and above the lamp, which didn't exist in that time. But this was originally placed by the owner. And these photographs were both used courtesy of George Ronald publishers with permission. The whole building, while building his mansion in the 1870s, Udi Hamar is moved to place an inscription in Arabic 
which eloquently foreshadows the events which will occur within its walls once Baha'u'llah inhabits the mansion. And this is what this inscription says in English. Greetings and salutations rest upon this mansion with increaseth in splendor through the passage of time. Manifold wonders and marvels are found therein and pens are baffled in attempting to describe them. We begin to have some very moving vignettes from pilgrims of, of Baha'u'llah's words regarding Abdu'l-Baha. In this vignette, Baha'u'llah speaks about Abdu'l-Baha as his mighty shield. And this is a view of Bahji and its gardens. Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, known as the Angel of Carmel, spent nine months on pilgrimage in Akka, the most memorable of his interviews with Baha'u'llah, the Blessed Beauty speaks at length about Abdu'l-Baha's protective role towards him, shielding him from the outside world, from the days of Baghdad to Adrianople, Akka, Masre, and finally Bahji. These are the words of Baha'u'llah about Abdu'l-Baha's role, reported by Haji Mirza Haidar Ali in his autobiography, which Abdu'l-Baha asked him to write. During the day, and this is Baha'u'llah speaking, during the days of Baghdad, we used ourselves to visit the coffee houses and meet with everyone. We associated with people, whether they, whether they were in the community or outside, whether acquaintances or strangers, whether they came from far or near. We considered those who were distant from us to be near and the strangers as acquaintances. We served the cause of God, supported his word, exalted his name. The most great branch, Abdu'l-Baha, carried out all these services, withstood all the difficulties, and endured the sufferings and calamities to a great extent in Adrianople, and now to a far greater extent in Akka. Because while in Baghdad, to all appearances, we were not a prisoner, and the cause of God had hardly enjoyed the fame it does today. Those who opposed it and the enemies who fought against it were comparatively few and far between. This is a very in-depth analysis by Baha'u'llah. It's stunning, absolutely stunning. In Adrianople, we used to meet with some people and give permission to some to attain our presence. But while in the most great prison, we did not meet with anyone and have completely closed the door of association with the people. Now, the master has taken upon himself this arduous task for our comfort. He is a mighty shield facing the world and its peoples. Since so, he has relieved us from every care. At first, he secured the mansion of Mazrai for us and we stayed there. Then the mansion of Bahji. He is so occupied in the service of the cause that for weeks, he does not find the opportunity to come to Bahji. We are engaged in meeting with the believers and revealing the verses of God, while he, Abdu'l-Baha, labors hard and faces every ordeal and suffering because to deal and associate with these people is the most arduous task of all. Okay, now, those of you who are familiar with my chronologies will know that I love donkeys. This is a story about Baha'u'llah's white donkeys, thunder and lightning. And I found an almost contemporary picture of a white donkey. I was very, very excited when I found this. Baha'u'llah spends the spring, summer, and autumn seasons in the mansion of Bahji. When he visits Akka, the Garden of Rizvan, Mazre, or Junaine, Baha'u'llah rides a white donkey named Bak, lightning, always accompanied by a servant. He was very fast. Bark, that's why he was called lightning. When Bark dies, another donkey is brought for Baha'u'llah from Persia, and this one is called Rad. 
thunder. These donkeys, my friends, are Baha'u'llah's freedom after being in prison for nine years in the city of Akka. He has donkeys and he has someone who walks next to him with a parasol to protect him from the sun. And Baha'u'llah can go places that are far away. He can go to Druze villages in the mountains. He can go to Mazrae, which is seven kilometers away. And go to the Garden of Junaina, which is even further. Freedom. Baha'u'llah's glory and majesty. By the time Baha'u'llah arrives in Bahchi, the edict of the Sultan Abdul Aziz, though still in effect, is in essence a dead letter. Though Baha'u'llah is still technically a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire, in Abdul Baha's words, the doors of majesty and true sovereignty were flung wide open. The rulers of Palestine envied Baha'u'llah's influence and power. Governors and muti sarifs, generals and local officials would humbly request the honor of attaining his presence, a request to which he seldom acceded. In Bahji, uh, Baha'u'llah almost never grants personal interviews the way he had in Baghdad. Baghdad was very special. He even himself said that he was not even a prisoner there. But Baha'u'llah's influence is so powerful that the people of Akka attribute the improvement of the city's water and climate and air to Baha'u'llah's long residence in the area of Akka. They feel such reverence towards Baha'u'llah that they refer to him as August leader and his highness. A European general granted a rare interview with Baha'u'llah along with the governor of Akka is so overcome that he remains kneeling on the ground by the door and has to be excused. Now we're going to return to Abdul Baha's life in Akka between 1879 and 1880. And we begin with a really lovely, lovely uh, story of May 1880, Middat Pasha meets Abdul Baha in Akka. And I can please encourage you to come to the next two Sundays of Clearwater's Storytelling Sundays, because we have Dr. Nejati Alkan, who is the world expert on the Baha'i faith in the Ottoman Empire, who's going to be giving a talk about exactly that. So this is like, this whole section here is based on a paper that Nejati Alkan wrote. And if you want to read this paper, which I encourage you to do, you can go to the chronology and you can click on the references and you can download the PDF. This amazing story. Uh, this is a photograph of Midhat Pasha. Uh, he was born in 1822 and he died in 1884. Midhat Pasha, known in Turkish as Ahmed Shafiq, is a highly capable and outstanding official of the 19th century Ottoman Empire. He is also a liberal reformer who as Grand Vizier will be instrumental in inducing the Sultan to grant a constitution to his people. He has encountered the Baha'i faith in Baghdad twice before in 1869, twice before. Oh yes, okay, so he was in Baghdad in 1869 and 1870 and he encountered the Baha'i faith there twice, both times treating Baha'is with fairness. He is appointed governor of Syria from late November 1878 to August 1880. Governor of Syria would be headquartered in Beirut. So in May 1880, Mirhat Pasha is on his tour of inspection of Palestine, a sort of region of Syria, according to the Ottoman Empire, having traveled overland from Beirut to uh, Palestine, and he visits Tiberias, Nazareth, Akka, and Haifa, from where he will board a boat to return to Beirut. Um, oh, wait. So this is what Beirut would have looked like in 1867, so 10 years before this story. During his long visit to Akka, 
Haji Mirza Haidar Ali recounts that hearing there is no more lovely place in the area than the Rizvan Garden, officials request that Midhat Pasha be allowed to visit. Midhat Pasha is enchanted by the condition, the beauty and the purity of the garden and by its flowers and correctly assumes it must belong to Abdul Baha, whom he has heard high praises about from many intellectuals. Midhat Pasha is also aware that Abdul Baha's utterances in Turkish, yet another proof of Abdul Baha's superhuman knowledge, because his Turkish was so eloquent, says Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, that he could reduce eloquent and learned men to a state of meekness and humility through his responses to their questions on spiritual matters. This is an aspect that Nejat, Dr. Nejati Alkan is very is an expert on. So we're going to learn a lot from him in the next two weeks. According to Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, Midhat Pasha says, for years I have longed to meet Abdul Baha. I have seen his utterance in Turkish that are beyond like or equal and eloquently testify to his vast knowledge. I have often heard many of the learned highly praising and extolling him. Midhat Pasha sends a courier with the message to Abdul Baha, I yearn to meet his excellency. And so Abdul Baha pays Midhat Pasha a visit. Midhat Pasha is so enchanted with Abdul Baha that he pays Abdul Baha a return visit. And during his two or three days in Akka, Midhat Pasha spends most of his time in the company of Abdul Baha and in his presence. As he is about to leave, he asks Abdul Baha to return with him to Beirut. <laughs> But the master, we've seen his load of work, the master declines. Once in Beirut, Midhat Pasha writes a poem, a couplet to Abdul Baha and expresses in this poem his desire to meet Abdul Baha again. And thanks to Dr. Nejati Al Khan, we have this couplet here. This is a little art I did with it. So this is the couplet written by Midhat Pasha in a letter inviting Abdul Baha to visit him in Beirut. This is the original Arabic, I think, yes. And then this is uh, in English. The desire of meeting thee made my soul to be at death's door. Should it return or enter, what is thy command? Oh, what do you do when you receive a poem like that? I think you go to Beirut. <laughs> so this is a map of, I, hold on, let me just, uh, just make this a little smaller too. There you go. Okay, and Beirut is up here and Akka is it? So it's 115 kilometers from Akka is Beirut. And Yarka, which we're going to be talking about here, is eight kilometers away from Akka. See, Yarka is a Druze village where Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha are going to meet. Akka is where Abdul Baha is. So here, in between Yarka and Akka, is where Bahji is. Bahji is sort of halfway between the Druze village and Akka. So Abdul Baha is going to go to Beirut and return probably. He's probably going to sail. Uh, we're going to have to ask Dr. Alkan this if he's here. Um, yeah, so Beirut, June 1880. Tuesday, 8th of June 1880. This is also from Dr. Nejati's paper. Front page article on the June 8th, 1880, Tamarat al Funun announcing Abdul Baha's visit to Beirut. Friends, this is modern Baha'i scholarship. It's extraordinary. Dr. Alkan found this, and now we have the newspaper article that talks about Abdul Baha's presence in, in Beirut. It's amazing. So this is the original Arabic, and then I'm going to read the English, because of course I can't read Arabic. His Excellency, the learned, erudite, intelligent, and illustrious Abbas Effendi, resident of the city of Akka has arrived in our city. The purpose of his arrival is change of air. May God prolong his well-being. 
Abdu'l-Baha visits Beirut from June 1st to June 17th, 1880. His arrival, as is the custom in the region, when any notable arrives in a city, is announced in the Beirut-based weekly Tamarat al-Funun newspaper on Tuesday, June 8th, 1880. From the 1st to the 17th of June, 1880, Abdu'l-Baha visits Mithat Pasha in Beirut. This is Beirut in the 1890s, 10 years later, a colorized photo, uh, postcard. Abdu'l-Baha receives many a warm welcome in Beirut. Apart from the very important Midhat Pasha, governor of the province of Syria, Abdu'l-Baha meets many eminent individuals from all walks of life. Foremost among them is Sheikh Mohammed Abdu, the future Grand Mufti of Egypt, an extraordinary, powerful, and influential position. Sheikh Mohammed Abdu is a good and righteous man, and he is thoroughly captivated by the immense width and breadth of Abdu'l-Bahá's knowledge, his charm in appearance, character, and manner. Sheikh Mohammed Abdu is so captivated by Abdu'l-Bahá, in fact, that he resolves to return to Akka with him. Abdu'l-Bahá dissuades the Sheikh because following through with this intention would have greatly harmed Sheikh Mohammed Abdu in his standing and in his reputation. Following his visit to Beirut, Abdu'l-Bahá, once again a prisoner within the walls of Akka, will receive letters from Sheikh Mohammed Abdu, as well as from other outstanding men of influence in Syria, clear testimonies to Abdu'l-Bahá's growing influence, reach, and impact in the society and government of the region in which he lives. On the 9th of June, 1880, Baha'u'llah reveals the Lahe ar the Tablet of the Land of Ba. This is another view of Beirut from the sea. In 1880, the actual year that Abdul Baha visits Beirut. So there is a one in 12 chance, uh, one in 365 chance that he might've been in this picture somewhere in the city of Beirut when this postcard was taken. So while Abdul Baha is in Beirut, on June 9th, 1880, Baha'u'llah reveals an extraordinary tablet in honor of Abdul Baha's visit to Beirut, the Lahe Arzeba, the tablet of the land of Ba. Ba is B. B is the first letter of Beirut. So the tablet of the land of B, Beirut. The land of Ba is a poetic way of saying Beirut. The station of Abdul Baha first unveiled, as we saw in the Suri i Rusn in Adrianople, 12 to 16 years prior to this tablet, are now fully emphasized in the tablet to the land of Ba, before being clearly enunciated in the Kitabi Ahd, the book of Baha'u'llah's covenant, which he reveals 11 years after the Lahe Arzaba. This is such an important tablet, I'm going to read it in its entirety. I want you, as homework, to go to the Utterance Project website and click on this graphic or search for Tablet of the Land of Ba in the search bar and listen to it in Arabic. But I'm going to read it to you in English because we are arriving towards the end of Baha'u'llah's life. Baha'u'llah is going to leave us. And Abdu'l-Bahá is going to be the center of the covenant. And we need to soak in what Baha'u'lláh says about Abdu'l-Bahá 11 years before his own ascension. Praise be to him. Well, let me just drink something before I start. Okay. Praise be to him who hath honored the land of Ba through the presence of him round whom all names revolve. All the atoms of the earth have announced unto all created things that from behind the gate of the prison city, there hath appeared and above its horizon, there hath shone forth the orb of beauty of the great, the most mighty branch of God, his ancient and immutable mystery proceeding on its way 
to another land. Sorrow then thereby hath enveloped this prison city, whilst another land rejoices. Exalted, immeasurably exalted, is our Lord, the fashioner of the heavens and the creator of all things. He through whose sovereignty the doors of the prison were open, thereby causing what was promised aforetime in the tablets to be fulfilled. He is verily potent over all that he willeth, and in his grasp is the dominion of the entire creation. He is the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Blessed, doubly blessed, is the ground which his, Abdul Baha's, footsteps have trodden. The eye that hath been cheered by the beauty of his countenance. The ear that hath been honored by hearkening to his call. The heart that hath tasted the sweetness of his love the breast that hath dilated through his remembrance, the pen that hath voiced his praise, the scroll that hath borne the testimony of his writings. We beseech God, blessed and exalted be he, that he may honor us with meeting him soon. He is in truth the all-hearing, the all-powerful, he who is ready to answer. There are two things in this tablet that get me every time. One is when Baha'u'llah says, all the atoms of the earth have announced unto all created things. Then when he describes Abdu'l-Baha as God's ancient and immutable mystery, Well, I guess then when he says that Akka is sad and Beirut is happy that they're going to be missing his company and getting his company or missing his footsteps and getting his footsteps. I just love when Baha'u'llah personalizes things in cities and mountains. But then really the thing that touches me the most is that Baha'u'llah begs God that we beseech God, blessed and exalted be he, that God may honor Baha'u'llah with meeting Abdul Baha soon. That to me is everything. Wow. The far reaching significance of Abdul Baha's visit to Beirut. Shoghi Effendi's words are going to act as a guide for us to understand the weighty significance of Abdul Baha's journey to Beirut. At the time of his visit, Abdul Baha is 36 years old, and he has been living in Akka for 12 years now, most of his adult life. Outwardly a prisoner, Abdu'l-Bahá is a respected figure in Akka, and through the majesty of his saintly character and profound knowledge, his influence has radiated in the region surrounding Akka, and it has radiated all the way to Beirut in Syria. These are the words of Shoghi Effendi in God Passes By. It was through the extraordinarily warm welcome accorded Abdu'l-Bahá during his visit to Beirut through his contact with Midhat Pasha, former Grand Vizier of Turkey, through his friendship with Aziz Pasha, whom he had previously known in Adrianople and who had subsequently been promoted to the rank of Vali, and through his content association with officials, notables, and leading ecclesiasts, who in increasing number had besought his presence, that during the final years of his father's ministry, that he had succeeded in raising the prestige of the cause he had championed to a level it had never previously attained. So as we approach the end of the life of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha is single-handedly raising the prestige of the faith to a level it's never reached so that when Baha'u'llah passes away, the faith will be at its most brilliant and most prestigious. And now we come to Yarka, that Druze village I was telling you about. So estimated the 18th, 19th of June, 1880, until the 24th, 25th of June, 1880, I could not find a picture of Yarka, but I did find some Druzes 
in uh, 1901, Druze villagers near Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon actually it's quite nice because it's it's what you see from the from Akka and from Bachi and from Masra. You see Mount Hermon, so they're really close to Mount Hermon. You see the I, th I think that's actually Mount Hermon. As Abdul Baha is returning from Beirut, Baha'u'llah leaves Bahji and for the Druze village of Yarka, eight kilometers northeast of Akka, where he remains for seven nights. Abdul Baha joins him in Yarka for the last four nights. There is a record of Baha'u'llah once spending three months in Yarka. And the Blessed Beauty also visited the Druze villages of Abu Sinan and passed through or near the villages of Raz, Rab Siye, Sheikh Danun, and Sheikh Davoud, as well as An Afifi, to visit the garden of Humumi near the village of An Nar. So, as you can tell, Bahala spent quite a lot of time in these Druze villages with his white donkeys. Of all these villages, the name you need to remember is Abu Sinan because it will play an important life in the role of Abdul Baha and his family during the First World War, which we will address in part eight. So now we return to the life of Abdul Baha in Akka after his visit to Beirut in 1880, 1891. And sometime before 1885, the Mufti of Nazareth welcomes Abdul Baha like a king. This is looking down at Nazareth from the hills above around the 1870s. So around the time, no, 15 years before this. Sheikh Yusuf, the Mufti of Nazareth, visits Akka at some point in the 1870s and falls under the spell of Abdul Baha's wonderful charm, knowledge, eloquence, and majestic dignity. After leaving Akka, he corresponds with Abdul Baha, gives him a noble horse as a gift, and invites him to Nazareth. When Abdul Baha arrives in Nazareth with his brother and the Mufti of Akka, they find that Sheikh Yusuf has sent all the notables of Nazareth, several kilometers along the road to welcome Abdul Baha, truly a king's welcome. And now we begin a great, great adventure between Abdul Baha and the Galilee and the Jordan Valley. In some time during this period, properties around the Sea of Galilee are purchased at Baha'u'llah's bidding around what is now Ein Gev and Samras. But we are approaching unpleasantness, my friends. I have to warn you, after all this wonderful, happy, we have a very jealous governor that comes in 1885. This is the house of Abud, its balcony, inside courtyard, outside views, inside of the room of Baha'u'llah, because this, my friends, this beautiful house of Abud is the object of jealousy in this story. Muhammad Yusuf Pasha has previously been the governor of Akka at the time when Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah were in the most great prison. He was a jealous and greedy man, but he's not ignorant of Abdul Baha's station and his knowledge and his wisdom. While he was first governor, there was an argument between Christians and Muslims that could not be resolved. And the governor of the city called on Abdul Baha, the prisoner in the most great prison, to come and resolve the argue. And he impressed everyone when he did that. He did it in such a way that was so brilliant, everyone was just speechless. So Mohammed Yusuf Pasha returns to Akka for a second governorship. 15 years have passed, and unfortunately for him, the prestige and the station of Abdul Baha and the Baha'is and Baha'u'llah has risen, and his own has diminished. So there is an inverse relationship of sort of uh, their esteem, in a sense, because when he arrives, 
The Ottoman government has sold the governor's residence and he is forced to rent a very small house that is very near the much, much larger house of Abud. So of course, he is a deeply jealous man, so he becomes jealous. As fate would have it, this is just unfortunate timing. Muhammad Yusuf Pasha arrives to take up his post as governor of Akka while Abdul Baha is hosting the Mufti of Nazareth who received him like a king. So the Baha'i neighbors are showering Sheikh Yusuf with hospitality and Muhammad Yusuf Pasha becomes very jealous because basically he arrives unnoticed and has to live in a small house and his neighbors are now the Baha'is that were in the most great prison when he was here 15 years ago. So all of this is just bad and the worst of all of this is that the poisonous influence of the covenant breakers constantly egging him on and encouraging him, he starts to make absolutely constant, incessant demands to Abdul Baha to vacate the house of Abud so he can move in. He goes so far as to lie that the Vali, the governor of the administrative division, requires that he occupy the house of Abud. The governor continues to pester Abdul Baha over the house of Abud for more than a year, even while Abdul Baha's saintly mother, Asiye Hanun, is desperately ill. The passing of Asiye Hanun in 1886, Her Highness the Mother. And to illustrate Her Highness the Mother, I have her three children here. Abdul Baha, the most great branch, Bahi Hanum, the greatest holy leaf, and Mirza Mehdi, the purest branch. Abdul Baha calls his beloved mother, Hadha'i Validi, her highness the mother. She was a tall, slender, graceful woman with dark blue eyes. The date of Asiya Hanum, Nawab's death, is unknown, but she had lived a difficult life exerting herself beyond endurance during three decades of arduous banishments. Nawab's health declines during the last eight or nine years of her life, but she dies as Mirza Mehdi did, both of them such gentle souls with such violent deaths. She falls from a great height. This is according to the unpublished diary of a Baha'i of Akka. It was found by the author Bahari Mani in her book, The Leaves of the Twin Divine Trees. When Asiya Hanum is dying and her end is near, Baha'u'llah is at her bedside, along with her beloved children, Abdul Baha and Bahi Hanum. The funeral of Nawab. Unlike the funeral of her beloved son, Mirza Mehdi, 16 years prior, her funeral, the funeral of Asiye Hanum, is held with the dignity due to her high station. The cortege is led by muezzins who call out for prayer in a mosque, reciters of the Quran, notables of Akka, Muslims and Christian scholars and learned ones all join the cortege along with school children who chant verses expressing their grief and poems. Abdul Baha's sorrow is overwhelming. Baha'u'llah refers to Nawab after her passing as the most exalted leaf, the manifestation of his cause, and the dayspring of his revelation, and the dawning place of his signs, and the source of his commandments, and calls her his companion in every one of his worlds. After 1886, the downfall of Muhammad Yusuf Pasha. Muhammad Yusuf Pasha demands an attitude, remain aggressive towards Abdul Baha, who is grieving after the passing of his mother. A duplicitous Christian merchant approaches Abdul Baha, hinting at a gift of money will definitely cause Muhammad Yusuf Pasha to leave him alone. Abdul Baha says he's going to retire to pray. And when he returns, he tells the merchant to go to the governorate. When the merchant arrives at the governorate, he finds that a cable has just arrived, firing Muhammad Yusuf Pasha and his accomplices for embezzlement. 
one of Muhammad Yusuf Pasha's accomplices, the head of the secretariat, runs away to Damascus in actual Syria and abandons his family. And who is going to look after his family, do you think? Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha provides for the family, ensures all their needs is met, and then pays for their trip when he sends them to join the father, accompanied by two Baha'is. So not only he paid for their tickets, but two extra tickets, round trip. That is Abdul Baha. 1886, the second book by Abdul Baha, A Traveler's Narrative, a book of history. This is Edward Granville Brown, dressed as a Persian in a studio photo. They're kind of like those photos we take at the mall. Vanity, I don't know, vanity pictures? I don't know what they're called. Abdul Baha writes a traveler's narrative, an account of Babi history. It is first published anonymously in Persian in 1890. The English translation is prepared by Edward Granville Brown and first published by Cambridge University Press a few years later in 1891. Unfortunately, oh, one year after the passing of Asiye Hanum, who had been with Baha'u'llah five decades, six decades almost, the passing of his brother who has been with him for six decades, the passing of Mirza Musa. One year after the devastating blow to Abdul Baha of the death of his mother, he loses his beloved uncle Mirza Musa, Baha'u'llah's younger brother, Mirza Musa, titled Aqai Kalim, him who conversed with God, who has been a constant companion of Baha'u'llah since 18 months after Baha'u'llah's birth. As a baby, Mirza Musa was attached to Baha'u'llah and he remained attached to Baha'u'llah his whole life until his last breath. He, Mirza Musa, was the one who was present when Baha'u'llah became a Babi. He became a Babi that same evening. Mirza Musa was the rock that Asiye Hanum relied on when she had four children and Baha'u'llah was in the when she had the three children and, and Baha'u'llah was in the Siat Chal. Oh, Mirza Musa. He is the one who found a wonderful house for the family to live when they were being persecuted by Mirza Yahya while Baha'u'llah was in Suleymaniyeh and he took care of them. He is the one who found Baha'u'llah in Suleymaniyeh with Abdul Baha at the Iranian embassy. Always, always there. Always, always. He, he rented a garden for Baha'u'llah in Baghdad. Uh, he even helped Nabil write the Dawnbreakers. Uh, so he is elevated to the station of Apostle of Baha'u'llah by Shohi Effendi in the Baha'i World Volume 3, 1928, 1930, page 92. And the first name is Mirza Musas. Of the 19 apostles of Baha'u'llah, the first name is Mirza Musas. And Shoghi Effendi's description states eloquently, Mirza Musa, the only true brother of Baha'u'llah, comma, surnamed Kalim. This, was, this is one of the photos of Mirza Musa. In one of his visits to Akka, Baha'u'llah stayed in Mirza Musa's home for eight days and nine nights. And each day and each night during his stay, uh, Baha'u'llah permitted all the believers to come into his presence and they were spellbound by his utterances and the outpouring of his love. It was a wonderful evening that many pilgrims spoke about. So, let's see. I, oh gosh, I'm going to stop with this one because the next one is, oh, hold on, let me just, yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm actually going to stop at this vignette here, Abdul Baha's children and their grandfather, because we don't have very much left for this part. I think we'll finish this part tomorrow. And um, I think my voice is going a little bit. 
Um, so we'll pick up here tomorrow. I want to apologize to everyone preemptively. I am unable to have questions tonight because I am have the beginning of a sore throat and I want to keep my voice for tomorrow. So I'm going to put my email and I'm going to read it out loud for the people watching on YouTube. My email is v, Violetta Z, V I O L E T T A Z at gmail.com. And if you have any questions for today, I'll, I'll respond to them by email. I want to thank. Clearwater Baha'is for your kindness and your patience in running this Zoom. <laughs> and also uh, thanks so much Firm Foundation Academy and Peter Terry for coming up with it. And also Desert Rose Baha'i Institute. And please uh, do join us on Sunday for the first of two talks with Nejati Alkan. Um, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, another amazing event organized by the Clearwater Baha'is. Do not miss it. This is the world expert on the Baha'i faith in the Ottoman times. So, all right. <laughs> Love you all. And I will see you tomorrow. Sorry about my